Hello, I'm uh, Ralph DeFranco, and I'm Professor of Medicine uh, and Chief of the Diabetes Division at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, uh, Texas. Uh, and I'm uh, going to give you a brief uh, overview uh, of the pathogenesis of uh, type 2 diabetes and its treatment based on our uh, current understanding of the pathophysiology of the disease. We know that individuals uh, who are destined to develop type 2 diabetes uh, are markedly insulin resistant. They inherit a, a set of genes from their parents uh, that make their tissues uh, refractory uh, to the action of insulin. And in particular, we know that the liver and the muscle are very, very resistant to insulin. However, early in the natural history of the disease, the beta cell is able to secrete uh, sufficient amounts of insulin uh, to offset uh, the defect in insulin action. However, with time, as this person who's destined to develop diabetes goes through life, the beta cells start to fail, the insulin levels start to decline, and as the insulin levels start to decline, the insulin resistance in liver becomes uh, manifest by an overproduction of glucose throughout the sleeping hours, and this leads uh, to uh, an increase in hepatic glucose production and an increase in the fasting glucose. And then when the diabetic gets up and has uh, his or her breakfast, lunch, uh, and dinner, uh, because of the severe insulin resistance in muscle and the concomitant decline in insulin secretion, there's an excessive rise in postprandial hyperglycemia uh, due to a, a defect in uh, muscle glucose uh, uptake. However, in the last decade, uh, we have now uh, had two major uh, novel findings in terms of our understanding of the pathophysiology of the disease. First, uh, we now recognize that the severity of the beta cell failure is much worse than previously appreciated and occurs much earlier in the natural history of the disease. And we know that people at the stage of impaired glucose tolerance, uh, those who are in the upper uh, tertile of IGT, have already lost some 70 to 80 percent of their beta cell function. The second important uh, concept uh, that has become clear in the last decade is that diabetes is a very complicated uh, disease uh, with uh, multiple etiologic disturbances. The core defects, insulin resistance in liver and muscle and beta cell dysfunction still remain. However, we know that there are many, many other abnormalities uh, that uh, occur in diabetic uh, patients. First, we know that the fat cells become very resistant to insulin. So normally, uh, when we ingest a, a meal that contains a fat or carbohydrate, the excess calories are stored in the adipocytes triglyceride. What keeps the triglyceride in the fat cell is insulin by blocking lipolysis. However, we've come to recognize that individuals with type 2 diabetes have severe resistance at the level of the fat cell, the antilipolytic effect of insulin uh, diminishes, uh, and there's a constant breakdown of triglycerides with release of free fatty acids into the bloodstream. The elevated FFA levels cause insulin resistance in liver and muscle and uh, aggravate uh, the uh, beta cell failure. So the insulin resistance in the fat cell, in fact, exacerbates the three core defects uh, that make up the triumvirate. We've also come to learn that the gastrointestinal tract is a giant endocrine organ, and it secretes two very important incretin hormones. First, it secretes glucagon-like uh, peptide 1, and second, gastric inhibitory polypeptide. Uh, these uh, incretin uh, hormones are very powerful stimulators of insulin secretion and also inhibit glucagon. We've come to learn in individuals with type 2 diabetes that uh, there is a major resistance to the stimulatory effect of both the GLP-1 and GIP on insulin secretion and suppression uh, of uh, glucagon by the alpha cell. We've known for a long time <clears throat> that the alpha cell overproduces uh, glucagon and that type 2 diabetics have very high fasting glucagon levels that fail to suppress normally following a meal. These elevated glucagon levels stimulate hepatic glucose production, uh, cause fasting hyperglycemia, uh, and contribute to the postprandial excessive rise in glucose. We've also come to learn that the liver uh, is uh, hypersensitive uh, to the uh, effect of glucagon. 
So we have two problems at the level of the alpha cell. First, over secretion of glutathione, and then second, uh, uh, hypersensitivity uh, to the stimulatory effect of glucagon on hepatic glucose uh, production. Most recently, we've come to learn that the kidney plays an important role in the pathophysiology uh, of type 2 diabetes. So normally, uh, in you or I, uh, individuals who have normal glucose tolerance, when our glucose exceeds 180 to 200 milligram per deciliter, the glucose starts to spill out in the urine. However, in diabetics, the kidney uh, receives a paradoxical stimulus. So as the blood glucose level starts to go up, <clears throat> contrary uh, to what would happen in a normal individual, we don't see the spillage of glucose into the urine. And the reason for this is that hyperglycemia upregulates the glucose transport system in the proximal tubulin, particularly the SGLT2 uh, transporter, and prevents the glucose from spilling out into the urine. So once the hyperglycemia develops, the kidney contributes to the maintenance of hyperglycemia, and we anticipate that the next new class of drugs to be approved for the treatment of type 2 diabetes will be the SGLT2 inhibitors that block uh, glucose reabsorption in the kidney and allow the glucose to be spilled out into the urine. And then, lastly, we've come to learn that the brain is resistant to insulin. Dr. Daniel Port showed many, many years ago that just small increases in insulin uh, are very anorectic. Well, what's driving the epidemic of diabetes is the epidemic of obesity, and obese people are markedly resistant to insulin. The beta cell responds uh, by a compensatory increase in insulin secretion, and despite the fact that uh, obese people and uh, diabetic people have elevated fasting insulin levels, they continue to eat and gain weight. So we know that there's insulin resistance at the level of the brain, and we also know that there are a whole host of other neurosynaptic transmitter disorders that contribute to this dysregulation of appetite.